We'll, we'll just begin. So um, I'll be cheering the committee until uh, Bob Doris has completed his urgent business. So um, I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary and all our officials once again um, to the Social Security Committee. Um, so I'm going to begin um, by just asking a few questions um, about the resourcing of the programme. Um, just beginning with the comments that Audit Scotland um, have made. So <coughs> we're aware that, um, that, that there's 345 core staff which are required for the agency, but that the agency has been routinely operating with 30% of their posts um, unfilled. Uh, obviously, if that's a great concern to, um, to the committee, and given that the pressures on the agency are only going to increase going forward, uh, Audit Scotland highlight that there's a high risk of decline in morale and we may lose more staff. So I suppose my first question is, how are we going to get a grip of the situation if the vacancies are as high as this, and given that going forward we need to make sure that we have the most experienced and skilled staff so the agency can uh, deliver ultimately at the highest standards. Cabinet Secretary. Okay, thank you. You've thrown me slightly, Deputy Convener, uh, by uh, by not allowing a, an opening statement, but I'm content to obviously go straight to questions. Um, the staffing issue is a, a very, very important one uh, that we take very seriously, both within the directorate and within the agency. If I can perhaps deal with the 30% figure, which uh, Audit Scotland uh, did point out, um, and explain um, how that was reached. Um, in the programme basically reports on the, the number of posts filled against the percentage of posts filled at a point in time against the projected end of year target. Um, that um, means that the Audit Scotland figure as at December 2018, the month that we gave them the figure, we had in post 70% of the staff that we thought we needed by March 2019. It didn't mean that we had only 70% of the staff that we needed at that time. In fact, the only uh, way we could have reported zero vacancies, um, in essence 100% currently filled, would have um, would for us to have staff in post in December that we didn't actually need until March. So it's important to, to I think, establish why that figure was 30%, and it's because it was measuring um, the in December against a projected requirement by uh, March, three months um, later. Uh, we have made improvements uh, to the recruitment uh, process uh, as of uh, mid-April, for example, uh, the uh, recruitment rate at that point was at 15% for, for that month. Um, and we are continuing to ensure that we look at the, the numbers of staff that are required and ensuring that we really do keep a very close eye on our planning requirements and the staffing requirements um, for that. Um, if I can deal directly also with the aspects around uh, staff morale, both within the agency and within the programme, the staff survey results uh, that have been published for Social Security uh, Scotland um, had a very high response rate and were very, very positive. Um, that uh, certainly chimes with my experience of my time when I, I visit uh, the, the agency. Um, and uh, David Wallace may want to say more about uh, morale and uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, our staff uh, are well looked after and well encouraged. Within the programme, I've obviously discussed the 2018 People Survey uh, with the Social Security Programme uh, Senior Management. Now, uh, Cabinet Office advice is that we uh, can't break down um, the core uh, Scottish Government people results below a Scottish Government organisational level. Uh, however, I, I can absolutely say there is nothing uh, within the, the outcomes uh, from the Social Security Director that, that causes me any concern, and I would not say that lightly, considering I'm surrounded by people from the Directorate at, at this um, point. Our results compare uh, very well to other Scottish Government divisions, um, and the programme 
indeed outperforms the Scottish Government average in a number of areas. Uh, so there is no issue with morale within the programme or within uh, the agency. This is a challenging programme uh, for people to work in. They are uh, working exceptionally hard. And I want to, at this point, uh, pay tribute to all the staff within the agency, within the programme and the wider directorate um, that have uh, delivered a social security system uh, one year on from the passage of the bill, that they can all be rightly proud of the part that they've uh, played. But I don't know if David wants to say some more about the, the agency staff as well. Yep, um, and, and I think the majority of members have now been certainly to Dundee to see the, the operations on, on the ground. J just in terms of the start of that question, I would draw some distinction between the agency and the programme. <coughs> At many levels, that's, that's irrelevant. But in terms of the agency, what, what we're looking, looking to build is the operational delivery arm that will continue ever after delivering social security. The programme, obviously, by its nature, is, is a more transformational programme, uh, so that the, both the staffing profile challenges are, are slightly different, certainly in terms of, of the agency. And I don't think the Audit Scotland figure particularly uses that 30% in relation to the agency, because I certainly wouldn't recognise it. Um, you know, there are, there are different challenges that we have in terms of building that up, but I would absolutely echo the... You know, the, the, those people engagement scores are phenomenally positive, 85%. Um, th these, are, these are benchmarked against the entire civil service of the UK. 85% for the agency puts us well towards the top of any uh, sort of indicators of that, that sense. My, the thing that um, keeps me awake isn't that it's 85%. It's actually how we maintain it as we, as we start to grow, because it was measured at a particular point in time uh, when we just launched. So we had that, uh, that buzz around about launch. But there is nothing from an agency perspective that gives me concern in that figure. Well, that is reassuring. I just want to be absolutely certain, because Audit Scotland said that there's a high risk. So you're clearly saying that there's not a high risk. Is there a medium risk, a low risk? What, what's... A higher risk of staff leaving? Um, of decline in morale. Audit Scotland said that given the pressures on the agency because at that time the 30% figure, and I know you've clarified that in December that is dramatically different, mm. which is um, pleasing to hear. Uh, I, I guess that uh, statement is based on the 30%, so it, you're really saying there's a, a much lower risk of... Morale decline. Yeah, I, I think consumer. much of what the Audit Scotland report um, quite rightly pointed out is what would happen um, if we did nothing from moving from the, the original benefits, uh, the Wave 1 benefits, to the disability um, as assistance benefits. So if we did nothing um, and we didn't recognise the challenges that we had coming up with the more complex benefits, then clearly there would be an issue with staff morale and clearly we would have a concern about the resources. Uh, but as the report also points out, we are doing a lot to ensure that um, we are stepping up. We've always recognised there is a difference between the benefits that we are initially delivering, that are one-off payments, uh, for example, you know, the Best Start grant, compared to uh, your disability assistance and, and carers' assistance, uh, that has been very clear right from the start to the government, and that's exactly why Audit Scotland have recognised we are putting measures in place to recognise that. So I, I suppose I, I, would, I would draw the, the committee's attention to, to, to the, the work that's already ongoing before Audit Scotland reported uh, to step up to the challenges. And that's why I'm mm. content <clears throat> with the fact that we are doing uh, a challenging programme, uh, but the staff that we have are working exceptionally hard and being supported in that work. Thank you. Um, just lastly, on that subject, it, uh, Audit Scotland also said that there's a reliance on temporary and contractor staff causing difficulties because of difficulty recruiting experienced staff. What do you see about that? The issue around contract staff um, is, is an interesting um, one, and it's something we do obviously pay a very close um, attention to, and I'll perhaps bring uh, Lisa in at, some, at one point on this as well. There will be challenges around certain areas of a, a large public service delivery, and we are delivering the largest change uh, since devolution around some key skills. And that's the same within the public se sector full stop. Uh, around particular skills that we have. 
So how do we deal with that? Well, we grow our own. In effect, we have a digital academy within the programme to ensure that we're developing skills within the Scottish Government. Um, and we continue to ensure that we're developing our recruitment to target those specific skills when we do have to bring people in. There are also points where, uh, you know, to be frank, it makes sense to have contracting staff rather than a permanent member of the civil service because there will be very specific skills that we only need for a very short period of time. And it would make absolutely no financial sense to have that person on a permanent contract rather than uh, on a permanent contract through the civil service rather than through a, a contract uh, themselves. So we need to look at when it's sensible to have contractor staff in when that's the right thing to do. We also need to make sure we've got everything in place required to develop our own skills um, and to ensure that we're doing all we can to compete in what is quite a challenging recruitment market in some way. I don't know if Lisa wants to add a little bit to that as well. Yeah, so it says, you know, it's unusually high. Well, we always anticipated a high level of contractors um, in the programme for all those reasons that the Cabinet Secretary said around the skills and bringing people in at the right time. Um, certainly around things like testing and those type of things, you'll bring them in at periods of time when we need them. So to actually have permanent members of staff uh, in those roles, it would be remiss of me to be paying them <laughs> for, for a whole 12 month period when you don't need to you just need to pay them for spells so i think we're doing you know the best we can we're doing a lot around recruitment so when we have contractors in we're doing succession planning with the people that we have in so we're training up our own people um just to touch on uh, the point around morale um i actually think we've got a great team uh, delivering the social security i know some of you guys came to visit us um, to uh, look at what we were doing uh, you'll have seen for yourselves that sort of the dedication of the people and the teams in there but i think that helps with you know we invest a lot in our people so we invest a lot in the the training the development so you know we're not just sitting back and, and waiting for things to happen you know we're, we're going forward uh, and proactively sort of getting the job done Thank you very much. Um, before I hand back to the convener, just apologies, Cabinet Secretary, that you didn't get your opening statement. What I would propose, if Bob's okay with this, that um, at the end of the questioning, we'll leave some time and you can uh, cover any issues that you feel that weren't covered. Okay, thank you. Over to you. Okay, um, thank you very much. My, my apologies to, um, to, to, to witnesses and those following the committee. I had to go out and deal with, with an urgent matter. Um, so I. I know that Jeremy Balfour had been keen to come in on, on this line of questioning, which I'm going to uh, I'm going to imagine it was a line of question I thought it was going to be before I walked out of the room, but Jeremy Balfour, yeah. I think it is, Convener. Um, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary and uh, everyone else. Um, just two, two quick questions to follow up on what you said, um, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, you said that the Audit Scotland figure for the number was November last year and the set date was April for this year that you would reach 100%. Did you reach that 100% figure by April? So the um, staff uh, number was for December. We gave all oh, the Scotland right. the figure. Um, and we were, S we were benchmarking that against the March 2018. So it was December to March 2018. Uh, I don't have the current vacancy rate to hand. Um, but that may be because the, the, the mid-April one would be the last one that I would have. Um, so the, the, the monthly rate at mid-April was 15%. But I can get further um, details on that if we've got a, um, a, a more recent up-to-date figure now that we're into me. But it may be that the point we're in May doesn't allow me to do that. But certainly, if I can get it, it's not in the briefing, I'll get it, I'll get it to the committee. And that would be really helpful, Cameron Secretary. And I suppose the other area which Audit Scotland picked up in regard to this, which had concerns for me, was around the whole IT cyber work um, area, which obviously, particularly around data protection, we're dealing with people's data here. Um, and there was, again, maybe a lack of able to bring in recruitment around this area. Um, and I just suppose, how are you going to address that? And, and is it simply that we don't pay enough, unless it's a very competitive market, this area, unless we have to maybe pay more? Is that, is that a purely financial issue that the private sector can pay more than government? Or is there something else underneath that which 
is causing problems around the IT recruitment. Well, I'll bring Andy in on this point as uh, well. We, we do have a challenge in, in the public sector around what public sector pay compared to what the private sector pays, but uh, the government is uh, looking quite innovatively at what can be done uh, with that to recognise a certain skill set. So uh, I think it would be fair to say that we are being as innovative as we can be to ensure that we are uh, recognising the fact that there are certain individuals that have certain skill sets uh, where there is a very small supply and a very large demand for those people. So that does make it um, challenging um, on this area. And some of the, the, the areas that Jeremy Belford has mentioned is, are, are those kind of key skills uh, that are in very, very short uh, supply. That's why the Digital Academy is very important, but it won't solve all our issues by any manner or means, because we are looking also for very, very experienced people to come in um, as well. And that's why it has to be that blend of the Digital Academy the use of contractors where necessary, and being as innovative as we can within the public sector uh, remit to, to encourage people in. But I don't know if Andy wants to say something particular about the very niche skills that come under his remit as well. Yes, yeah, so if, if I can pick up the two points, one is about the, the actual the whole cyber protection and the protection of citizen data. Um, all the work we've done from the outset has been with Secure by Design as, at the forefront of what we do. Everything we've been doing from the outset since 2017, we've been working close with the National Cyber Security Centre. And on the, on the subject of skills, we've been quite successful in the last 12, 18 months in bringing the right skills to market, in from the market, from a, a variety of sources, public sector and private sector. Have we got all the people we want to get first time? No, we haven't. Uh, we've had to complement some of those permanent skills with some contractor skills. But our campaigns of recruitment are relentless. We've been continuously recruiting. We've had a lot of success in the last 12 months. And as the Cabinet Secretary has referenced, we are looking at a number of measures and methods within the civil service pay structure and the pay supplements, working with the heads of the digital, digital profession to bring some flexibility, which gives us more tools at the point of appointment uh, and recruiting staff into the organisation. So we face the same challenges as everybody else does in, cyber, in the cyber world. There are a shortage, shortage of skills. There are more people coming out of, of universities being taken by the financial service sector, private sector. But equally, the public sector and our own programme is proving quite an attraction to a number of people who want to come into our programme because this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to actually develop your skills and be part of something important. Just, uh, I suppose, one final question around myself, if that would be OK. And that is, obviously, government policy and, and your predecessor had indicated to this committee on, on quite a number of occasions that all 11 benefits would be over to the, to the agency by 2021. Now, you've made that clear that's not going to be the case. Um, is, that, is that because of the IT issues? Is that something that came up when you took over as Cabinet Secretary that you realised that these 11 benefits couldn't be delivered by the Social Security Agency? Or, or, or just wondering, you know, obviously, which I bet your predecessor made some very firm commitments to this committee that all 11 benefits would be delivered by 2021 by the agency. That's clearly not happening. And I wonder, is that an IT issue? And if so, when did that become onto your radar? When did you make the decision as Cabinet Secretary that there would be a change at, uh, are you turning government policy? Just before you ask that question, Cabinet Secretary, and totally valid question to ask, but I know you missed part of the pre-meet, Mr Balfour, and there's some quite detailed questioning as the meeting goes on in relation to Wave 1 and Wave 2 benefits and what commencement and delivery actually means. So I just think as a courtesy to other members who want to explore some of that, I should make that point to the Cabinet Secretary as well before the Cabinet Secretary answers that, because others were here for the pre-meet and have got lines of questioning in relation to that, the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Um, what I will draw Mr Balfour's attention to is the Audit Scotland report that says that we are delivering the programme at a fast pace and to do so any faster uh, would not be possible when our first priority is, is safe and secure transition. So I think you know the committee often uh, quotes Audit Scotland reports uh, to the government. I, I would uh, suggest they read all of the Audit Scotland report and, um, and uh, particularly the sections where it's saying if your first priority is safe and secure transition, uh, we are moving at um, as, as fast a pace as possible. The second point I want to make is that we will take responsibility for all the benefits in April 2020. 
there is no change to the Scottish Government policy um, and our implementation of when we will take full responsibility for those benefits. How we will deliver those benefits was detailed within my statement uh, at the end of February. Um, and I'm presuming from the convener's remarks that there will be further questions on that that I'll be happy to take later. Michelle, but I'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I hope you don't yeah. mind, Mr Balfour, but there's a structure and focus to the questioning which, which, which we've planned and it's not fair to other members for you to then come in and explore that line of question at this point. A brief supplementary, Michelle Ballantyne. Yeah, I, I just want to go back to the um, issue around staffing. Um, accepting that you you know the the question around is now a 15 percent vacancy but i want to ask how that relates with the original estimate of 118 million um for the program whereas you've got a budget of 77.8 million did that mean you had to revise your staffing levels down at that point because that's a significant budget difference um and, and in which case if it was a downward revision and then the 15 percent vacancy um and this, I suppose this isn't an attack, it's trying to understand because we all know that actually implementing any digital system is really hard work um, and does require an enormous amount of skills and therefore pressure can come to bear and I, I, I know quite a few um, that I've talked to the people working on and they are struggling, um, not because they're not capable, not because they don't want to deliver it, but because simply the number of bodies working on it and the skills needed are tight. Um, so I'm just wondering whether you did have to revise it down number of bodies and that 15 percent is on top of that um, we have workforce planning in place that will ensure that the right people are in position at the right time now if there's changes to when those people are coming on board then obviously that may vary the the financial arrangements at a particular time um, so we'll keep a close eye on the budget overall for for staffing, um, but I, I, I think if um, if I'm correct, we are talking about the staffing cost implementation staffing costs overall. Is that correct? Well, um, as I understand it, the programme had estimated that it needed 118 million pounds in 219.20, but was actually allocated 77.8 million in the budget. Ah, right. So you must have had to cut some savings from your estimate of what you were doing. No, if I can explain the, the, the different mm. reasoning behind those uh, uh, figures. My, my apologies, I uh, thought we were talking about the implementation costs. The reasons why the, the numbers changed for the, the budget was simply because this is a very, very fast-paced programme. So you're looking at what your uh, estimates are at the beginning of the summer, and they are constantly refined. Um, and that's why when you get to the point where the, actually the budget sign-off is, is done, there will be a different number because this isn't a static uh, project. So we're not talking about we've had to cut money back or we've had to uh, not employ staff or uh, change the way that we're implementing uh, programmes. This is simply the more you look at, the closer you get and the more you look at and refine the levels of budgets, then uh, the, the, the estimate for what was required for that changed. So that's the reasons why the numbers went down from the initial summer estimates to when the, the budget was, was signed off. It's because we constantly refine our budgets. Uh, so if there is a requirement for any further expenditure, that will obviously uh, be dealt with within the, the spring budget revision. Um, and the, the programme you know, will be delivered as it is required uh, to, to do. But the reasons why the budget change is because, um, as Audit Scotland again pointed out, we need to. We need to constantly refine our budgets and narrow down and ensure that we're being as detailed as possible on that. So just for clarification, because it was... A very, very brief clarification. Yeah. I should also put on the record the committee will have a chance to consider the Audit Scotland report uh, in, in short order. Uh, and we've got a rolling programme of budget scrutiny where we will return to these kind of matters throughout the year. But so a very brief supplementary, Michelle. So you're saying that you had revised down the number of people you needed and the 15% vacancy is simply on that? No, I'm saying we revised our budget assessments overall, which is not just staff, 
It's the entire requirements of the programme. And at the beginning of the summer, we assessed the entire programme requiring a certain pot of money. And by the time we refined that down when the budget's required to be signed off, it was a lower case. We, we, we did not change the, the number of, of people that were required for the programme because of financial issues. We were refining what the programme required in terms of staffing, in terms of estates, in terms of IT, and we refine the budget from that. Okay. Well, clearly we'll need to come back to that. Well, yeah, we need to come back to that. It might be help, help for clarity. There's a chicken and egg thing going on here, if you if you'll excuse, excuse the analogy. Did the needs of Social Security Scotland dictate, and the staffing levels required dictate the budget, or did the budget dictate the staffing levels? The needs of the Social Security programme dictated the budget, and the budget is set on what we are required to do to deliver the programme. I don't know, Lisa, I can add a, a little bit of detail to this as well that may assist. The other thing to remember in all this is obviously we're letting contracts to support us in our delivery of wave two. So it's only when those bids come in and we evaluate those bids do we know the level of resourcing that the suppliers bring with them. Yeah. So we've let two contracts so far. We've got another big contract that's still in train that we will let. But we have to adjust our staffing figures to match against those contracts because obviously the contracts will bring different levels of resource with them. So that's how we adjust and we have to sort of change that over time. Uh, so that's how the staffing figures have been adjusted. And, and the committee will have a chance to return to this when we, when we look at the Audit Scotland report. Th thank you for that. Next line of questioning, Shula Robison. Good morning. Um, the Audit Scotland report, which I know we're going to come back to um, in more detail, um, did make uh, a comment that uh, there's still a substantial amount of complex work requiring uh, to deliver the remaining Wave 1 benefits by the end of 2019. I just want to turn to to this. Um, first of all, just a general question, and I've got a couple of specific questions. Uh, the general question is really what, what still needs to be put in place before the remaining Wave 1 benefits can launch. What are the, the kind of main things that need to be put in place? Well, for the Wave 1 benefits, um, we have the staff within programme and within agency that we require to deliver the rest of Wave 1. So it is purely now a, the delivery of, of that. Um, the, the, the aspects within programme and, and agency are, are all uh, to schedule and working well to ensure that we will deliver. So the agency, for example, has the staff now required to deliver the rest of the Wave 1 benefits. Um, that recruitment is planned um, to ensure that the people are in and trained effectively right from day one. So we are um, in a good position for the delivery of the, the, the rest of the Wave 1 benefits. So the complex work that Audit Scotland refers to is really, by and large, been undertaken. It's now about the implementation of, of that. Okay. Yeah. For, for Wave 1, yes, I mean, obviously we have a great deal of work to continue to be ready for the, the uh, Wave 2 benefits, mm. for disability assistance, for, for carers and so on. Um, that work is, is also um, already ongoing. So, for example, um, I think as Lisa has pointed out, we have like two of the three major contracts that are required for Wave 2. Um, I had the pleasure of, of uh, sitting down with uh, some of the, the staff who are, are working in the digital portal uh, last week when I was down at Victoria Quay, so that work is already well in train. We have completed the discovery phase for all the disability assistance packages. That discovery phase is the first part of the, the Agile model, which we use and is exceptionally important because it's about ensuring that we're gathering the information in and we're listening to people about what they need from the system. So all of that has already been done for, for Wave 2. So in essence, uh, this year... <coughs> While you will see the go live of a, a number of, of benefits, we just saw one, of course, last week for Best Start Grant um, Early Learning, there is al already a great deal of work that's, that's well in train for the disability assistance and carers' assistance as well. Okay. And I believe some of the members may have um, a, um, talked through some of the details of that with programme colleagues when they were down at Victoria Quay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just a couple of specifics then. Um, the last year, the, the government consulted on regulations and a code of practice on investigating fraud 
in the Scottish Social Security system, which I think closed in October last year. Um, have you got a date of when the government intends to lay the regulations um, uh, on investigations and offences relating to that? Uh, so we do have that uh, public consultation that has uh, now that is now closed, and we will have independent analysis uh, of that. We will make sure that uh, the agency will publish interim operating guidance for investigations uh, shortly, setting out what powers investigation officers can use, uh, can do using existing information gathering um, powers. And we aim to lay the revised set of regulations and a code of practice for investigations in the Parliament before summer, with these um, in place well in advance of the initial wave two benefits. Okay, so before summer. And just finally, um, have you got a specific start date for the funeral expenses payments? Um, yeah, as I understand, um, the announcement is likely to be on the same day that the benefit is commenced. Is that right? Hey, what uh, we haven't announced a specific date, but as I, I said to an earlier question, we are on track for uh, delivery for uh, summer 2019. Mm -hmm. um, I should uh, tell the committee uh, today as well. I will write to to you formally, but the the uh, uh, name for for that um, um, uh, assistance will be the funeral support payment. That will be the the, the name that the the. Um, the, the benefit will, will go under. We're still on track for that summer 2019 uh, delivery. Uh, because this is a, a replacement to a DWP, um, although with 40% uh, extended eligibility, um, it's important that we work uh, extensively with stakeholders to build that in. Uh, so there will be prior notice given to uh, stakeholders mm -hmm. and we work exceptionally closely with the DWP on these areas around that go live date to ensure that, for example, if you phone up the DWP on the very first day that we've actually went live, DWP um, will also provide the correct advice to guide to Social Security Scotland. So that work with DWP and the work with stakeholders is, is well in train, as indeed it, it was and worked very successfully for the Best Start Pregnancy and Baby Payments. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um so those wave one benefits, of course, the, the first first real test of uh, um, of the Scottish government and the Scottish social security system. And I see from my notes here that the best start early learning payments open for application on the 29th of, of April last month. Could you update the committee on how that's going, Cabinet Secretary? It's going exceptionally uh, well, uh, Convener. Uh, the um, analysis that we have had uh, so far ensures uh, that we know that the, the systems are working with the agency and again it might maybe bring in David to talk about what it's actually felt like for the staff and how that's been um, d delivered um, within that um, but in terms of um, figures there's been more than 11,000 applications for Best Start grant that were received in the week following launch, and, and that's best start grant will include the pregnancy and, and baby payments um, as well. Um, the first applicants for the early learning payment uh, have received their payments already. Now, David can remind me about what the average is now for a steady state for pregnancy and baby. It's 100. So. In terms of volume, yeah. it's around about 100 per Day of, yeah. of the so initial ones. we can assume that the vast, vast, vast majority of the 11,000 applications for the Best Start grant have indeed been for the early learning payment, but we'll keep a close eye on that. And obviously, as our statistics become more robust, we can break the figures down to, to where, who are, who are applying and, and for, for which uh, grant. But it's gone very successfully, both from an operational perspective and indeed from the fact that uh, people have now received their first payments. And I should remind the committee that this is a, a brand new payment that was not available uh, within the um, previous regimes within the DWP. I don't know if David wants to say a little bit about what it's been like on the... <coughs> Yep. I, so just, just to echo the comments of the Cabinet Secretary, it, it has gone incredibly smoothly in terms of a launch of, of a benefit. I think for some of that is the reasons we've already discussed around incremental building of capacity. So when we reflect back on what we did in December with the first payments, we weren't just paying our first benefit. We were having our case management system launched on the same day. We were having uh, our client channels in terms of telephony opened on the same day. So when we opened for Best Start, uh, pregnancy payments back in December, there was a whole raft of infrastructure had to go live at that same point. For 
the, the recent launch um, of the early learning payments, obviously we've had people uh, in post for a period of time now, they're familiar with the systems, they're familiar with dealing with our client groups, all that sort of capacity has been built up over time. So, so the launch on the 29th of April, although we're sitting here only sort of a week and a half, up, you know, gone from that, is, is incredibly uh, smooth in terms of what it feels like on, on the ground. And certainly, uh, I think we see that difference from a second benefit launch of, uh, you know, just, just far, far easier to plan for it out and, and in terms of, of how people feel around about it, but with that kind of same energy of, of making first payments as, as well. I, I'm no doubt we might touch on lessons learned and things like that later in the session, so we can say a little bit more around about Hold that. Hold on to that thought, because I've got one final question, but, that, but it's not on that. I think that question might be coming up fairly shortly. Um, so, again, my notes are, are seem to be that there's an anticipation the Scottish Government's committed to rolling out the funeral expenses assistance or support uh, grant, as it's going to be called by the end of the year, Best Start Foods, and the Young Carers Grant um, by the end of this year. So that's still a bit away. Uh, so a bit of flexibility around the launch date for that, but I do see the Best Start Grant for School Payments op opens for applications in June, so that's an imminent deadline. Um, is arrangements with that fully finalised? Are you confident that will work well? Do you have any projections and uptake in relation to that? Well, the, I think that... Yes, it's working well, um, and uh, there are there are no concerns either from programme or from agency perspectives about the, the next uh, delivery. Uh, you know, these are still challenging um, projects to, to, to land, um, and I and I think um, you know I, again I want to pay tribute to all the staff uh, who work particularly on that weekend and the go live point um, is is um, a, a particularly interesting time um, within social security but they deliver it exceptionally well and with great professionalism with, within that. Um, so we are absolutely um, on track for that uh, June delivery of the school age and for the um, funeral support payments within the summer um, and also the Young Carers Grant um, as well. So all of those uh, projects at this point um, are on time and are, are, are giving me no concerns. I mean... Um Finally, cabinet section. I mean, like by definition, households would rather have more money rather than less money. So the, these be good things, kind of state and obvious a little bit. But how does the Scottish government measure the impact of the additional money that individuals or households will be getting? Because it's, 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 it's a fairly confident assertion that this is a good thing to give. A, you know, if you like vulnerable low-income households additional support, absolutely. But how do you actually measure the impact rather than just saying this will help low-income or vulnerable households? Well, I think there's just two aspects of that. It's, it's you know it's too early to be able to measure that at, at the moment. So I go with the, the anecdotal evidence that I certainly pick up for when I'm out uh, speaking to individuals that are helping us deliver those benefits. I was particularly struck by one lady I spoke to in Glasgow who talked about how she had been unable to take up uh, a place for her child at nursery because she couldn't afford some of the necessities around outdoor wear and plimsolls and so on. And that was the barrier for her to be able to take up a free place um, within her local nursery. Now, at that point, she was, uh, you know, luckily to be helped by a charity. But the, 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 the payment that has been set up within early years, um, you know, in the future would give someone with those concerns as, as a family uh, the reassurance that then they can take the same opportunities as other young people would be able to take. Now, obviously, we'll build within that anecdotal evidence within the work that's within my uh, colleague Aileen Campbell's portfolio when we're talking about uh, tackling child poverty, for example, to be able to see the difference that that makes. It would be helpful to capture that in a, a, a structured fashion. I think the, the committee would appreciate that. Uh, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Governor. Um, Honourable Cabinet Secretary, um, just to ask how the experience of launching the Carers Allowance Supplement and both payments um, so far of a uh, Best Start grant are then informing your plans um, as we go forward to, to, to further benefits. Well, we do take very seriously the aspects around lessons learned, and there has been a, a great deal of work that's went in to ensure that we do learn all those lessons. 
Um, that's been uh, work that's carried on, not just within programme, but also working very closely programme and agency together, um, because at the end of the day, the programme hands over to, to the agency and this needs to work uh, seamlessly. It's also been important to point out, I think, that we've done joint lessons learned aspects with DWP and indeed uh, um, I had the opportunity um, to, to be able to, to have that presented to me in a joint presentation, which again shows how uh, we are, this is a joint programme with the DWP and both are taking very, very seriously those lessons learned aspects. So um, in terms of um, what we can reflect on from that, we don't just learn lessons from uh, the Carers Allowance Supplement and uh, the Best Start Grant, but we also have taken a lot of time to learn lessons from other public sector projects as, as well, both within the DWP um, and Scottish Government. Uh, I give uh, some examples. Uh, colleagues may want to, 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 to touch on, on other examples in, in particular, but I'll give a couple examples about how we've dealt with the improvements. So, for example, a clearer eligibility around residency criteria on the application form. Um, there are uh, a very... Um, significant number of applications that we were getting in for Best Start grant that were not from people in Scotland. Um, and we therefore had to uh, adapt that. Um, we're taking a revised approach to our external communications planning. Um, we're increasing capacity and capability, uh, particularly in testing roles, for example, or technical roles. The use of the model office, which has been complemented uh, by Audit Scotland, has been an exceptionally positive one um, and one which we are continuing um, to, to, to build on. So we do take very seriously the lessons learned for a go live, but it's also inherently built into the programme um, to ensure that we are uh, developing that lessons learned at a, at a, at a programme level, not just waiting for a go live point, but kind of a continuous improvement as well. But I don't know if colleagues want to, to kind of point on some other um, lessons learned that I've not touched on so far. As well as a Clearly, we, you know, from the get-go, we did a lot of work around looking across government, um, both in the private and the public sector, around you know good lessons learned for, for major programmes. Uh, I think our initial um, investigations showed that uh, anything that we do has to be based on what the customer wants. Uh, again, for any of the you guys that have visited us, uh, you know that uh, it's based on a lot of user research. We use the experience panels. You know, so one of the biggest things for us was actually making sure that we're delivering a service that actually meets uh, the people of Scotland's needs, what they want. Uh, and building on that, so that was sort of one of the one of the main things for me. Um, yes, we did learn a lot from our go live weekends. They can be quite challenging, um, but again, we uh, put improvements in place. We have um, a ro very robust information centre um, that we have controls in place, and our chief digital officer uh, plays a very active role in uh, managing us through go live. Again, from the lessons learned, we learn from the uh, carers allowance and best start grant. You touched on that um, figure of or just how high the number of applications came from non-Scottish postcodes, and I guess that is essentially a, a complement of um, how well publicised the, the payment was and how well the government did in getting that, that message out. But, I mean, it was over 10% of applications. Just what extent did that um, clog up the system as you launched that first payment? And what is, what's the change now that kind of makes that... Um, more streamlined and hopefully will take um, less, de less staff time to process um, Scottish it's applications. It's as simple as, as ensuring, do you live in Scotland? <laughs> and that being right at the start. And I, I, you know, it's, it's not something, clearly we have to test eligibility, but it's perhaps not something that we thought we'd have to really point that out as stringently as, as we did. The 10% figure, as, as you see, um, was higher than anticipated. I mean, obviously, with a, a, a go live of a, a new type of benefit that we had put a great deal of work into encouraging take up, obviously, you are going to get people um, applying who might not quite be eligible, who might not quite understand the eligibility. And that's one of the challenges as we develop new things is to ensure that we're getting that communication right. So that's one of the areas, as I said, that we're constantly trying to learn from, is how do you make that more apparent um, right from uh, the start? Uh, I don't know if David wants to, to, to pick up some of the, the comments um, around 
just the sheer level of of, uh, the, of applications which came in um, was far higher than anyone anticipated, including uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts did not anticipate anything like um, the first couple of weeks. And I know I've done this a couple of times already, but I make no apology for doing so. Again, the agency staff who dealt with that um, were uh, to be absolutely commended for how they picked up that because it was... Um, a, a huge gargantuan effort to be able to deliver that. So yes, um, the uh, times for um, delivering a payment were, of course, slightly longer than we would have liked. I think, hope that's understandable given the level of applications uh, that we had in. But the staff dealt with it um, in a tremendous way. And again, I hope the committee is reassured by the fact that the agency had contingency plans in place to ensure that it could pick up even over a Christmas and New, New Year period to be able to deal with the challenges on the application backlog. Uh, shall I say just a little bit more on that? So, so linking those two things together, one of the big lessons learned, I think, for, for the agency um, and our advisory body was particularly interested in it was that profile of applications. So after the December launch, we did a lot of work with our analysts around about that profile. So for, for the recent launch of the early learning payment, we, we effectively that that profile was modelled into it. So, so that kind of expectation that we would have a surge of applications in the early days and weeks and then it would tail off into normality. So, so that is part of the reason why the April launch has been smooth because that's, that's effectively the profile of applications that we've been expecting. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary is saying, you know, again, in terms of um, people not resident in Scotland, that's something that we've, we've had lots of conversations about how we can uh, manage that better. Some of it is communications, but yes, a direct result of that, the application now looks different. Um, the, the correct decision was saying we can't stop people applying. Legislatively, we can't stop people applying for, through the process, but the the, the, the sort of the warning, as it were, up front around about your likely chance of eligibility if you're applying from a non-Scottish postcode is now sort of front and centre of that application process. But I think it does just demonstrate that we're able to sort of take the, the feedback that we're getting on the ground and sort of play that directly back in, into the system. And again, just again, building on that lessons learned from that very activity. So what we have done and um, what we did for the early years is we did, um, we put in place more robust performance testing. So we tested the system for the unprecedented volume. So if we were to get unprecedented volumes in the future, then we've got a system that can stand up to those volumes. Uh, and again, um, for the early years, we put uh, a throttle in our system so that again, if the volumes were so unprecedented that we didn't know, we could actually control those into the system so that we could ensure that the system doesn't fall over. Okay. Can I ask um, why 13% um, of Best Start applications um, took longer than 21 days to process? Is that purely down to the volume? Is that um, a figure that you'd expect to, to come down over time? So part of it will be volume. The other aspect of it is, um, although um, the system itself automatically can check for evidence whether a, a person um, is, is pregnant and, and so on through the register for the baby box. There will be some points, if that's not available, where we will require more information from, from the individual applicant. Um, and I, I, again, I, I don't see that as um, a challenge if the cases are being held open for the right reason. So the other alternative we could have done that might made the figures look slightly better would be we just close the application. You haven't given us the right evidence, so we're not going to process it, and your application is now closed. You'd have to reapply. But we keep the application open, and there is discussion with the applicant about what they are required to, to bring to be able to give us the right evidence. So that's the other reason why a case may take longer is because we are attempting to assist the applicant to gather the evidence to ensure. Now, say for the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, that's not required because it's, it's automatic. But for the cases it does, we make sure we keep that application open um, and assist the client rather than closing them down. And, and finally, Camina, if I could just ask about um, any regional variance there has been on applications to best start, whether there's any areas of the country that are uh, particularly high in 
perhaps are there areas that might have been more than expected? Just what your view on the picture across the whole country has been? Well, it's a, it's a really important point that, I mean, we, we are very, very pleased with the take-up overall of, of Best Start Grant, but that does in no way mean that we're just sitting back and and you know congratulating ourselves on a on a programme well delivered because there are regional variations to the, the amount that's the amount of applications that are coming in or indeed the applications that are coming in and then being um and are then being processed to a, a, a payment, for example. So we see other regional variations in terms of there's a lot of people that are applying that might not be eligible, for example. So all of that's getting looked at to ensure if we need to do more work around take up in particular areas, if we've got challenges in particular areas. <clears throat> so the the information that we've published last week on the the, the regional variations um, was a very very important big starting point to allow us to be able to analyse it, tease that out and indeed work with our local delivery leads to see what more can be done around local communications um, and so on to pick up those variances. The other aspect we'll obviously look at very closely is different demographics within a, a region as well to ensure that we're perhaps reaching um, you know, difficult to reach parts of our community that, that may not usually um, um, seek the, the, the benefit payments that they are entitled to. Thank you. Okay, uh, before the, my next member in, uh, Alison Johnson, am I correct in saying it was this theme you were hoping to ask questions? Okay. Yes, on? thank you. So to, to Alison now, and I've got a note for a supplementary for yourself, Michelle. Alison. Okay. Uh, thank you and good morning. Um, I'd just like to ask on that um, paper that was published last week, one of the other lessons learned was the, the need to build in contingency to financial planning. Um, so I'd like to understand what has been done to ensure that that financial planning is robust and also to understand what progress has been made in improving the data that is available for making forecasts of demands, not only for Best Start Grant, which we've been focused on uh, this morning, but also all the other Scottish benefits. So on the aspect around forecasting um, uh, initially, um, it is very difficult to forecast um, for new benefits in particular. So um, our analysts uh, do a tremendous work to, to, to forecast to the best of our abilities. Obviously, we receive the, the forecast from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, which we have to use for our budgetary um, analysis. Now, the best start grant um, success um, will, uh, I think, in, ensure that we might need to revise those forecasts up. I, I don't consider that a bad thing in the slightest because we had actually anticipated um, a greater take-up than, than perhaps the, the Fiscal Commission had. But it is very, very challenging to, to forecast for a, a new uh, benefit, uh, a new payment, and particularly when we are changing both eligibility and how much we are attempting to encourage take-up. Uh, so we will look at that very, very closely. I know the Scottish Fiscal Commission is, is due, I think it's in May, to, 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 to take out other forecasts on that as well. Uh, so they are looking at this very, very seriously too. I you know, should stress the point, these are demand-led budgets, so if people apply and they are eligible, they will receive the money to which they are um, entitled. Uh, but there is a recognition going forward for this Parliament that we are taking on more and more demand-led budgets uh, that are difficult to forecast, and that will be challenging for both the government and the Parliament as we analyse budgets um, in, in future years. So I hope that answers the, the, the question um, uh, around the, the forecasting. In terms of um, finance, I'll perhaps bring um, Kevin in a little bit again to talk about the lessons learned that we've done within finance um, as, as well. This is obviously something that Audit Scotland uh, did um, point to, but again, I, I go back to the point that before Audit Scotland um, had, uh, way before Scotland, Audit Scotland had, had reported, We'd already commissioned an independent review of the finance team. Um, we've ensured, for example, already that we've separated the social security programme and the agency finance functions. Again, recognising we're taking that step change. Um, we've recruited, have in post, um, finance team leaders. 
and we're ensuring that we've got specific improvement activities that are planned and ongoing um, to, to, to ensure that we look at any gaps that, that we still have and working very, very closely, of course, with Audit Scotland following on. So those are a, a kind of flavour of what we've already put in place uh, to, to deal with the step change that, that we are now looking at as we move to wave two. And I don't know if Kevin wants to touch on a little bit more yes. of the detail on that. Yeah, I, I, can, I can add a bit more um, depth and colour to the Cabinet Secretary's <laughs> um, answer there. Um, for me, when it comes to our, our finance capability and enhancing our arrangements for Wave 2, it comes down to people and, and process. So we've already taken steps to, to get the, it, enhance the, the people structure in the finance team. So we have experienced team leaders in the, the three key areas of financial planning, financial control and management reporting. And these, these, um, these team members will be developing our, our, our capability um, in, in those areas. Um, as far as process is concerned, it's important to recognise that on the programme we are refreshing the programme business case for Wave 2 um, and we already have a number of project and, and product level business cases on the programme which support the investment decisions um, around IT and service design on an ongoing basis. And to pick up on the point about contingency, in, in, our, in our business cases, when we're making investment decisions, we make sure that we apply um, the appropriate level of optimism bias as per the guidance in the HM Treasury Green Book to make sure that investment decisions are, are fully taking into account the uncertainties um, therein. And as uh, business cases and projects progress through the project life cycle, we, we manage down the level of optimism bias as requirements become more certain. It's also important to note that this is an agile program of delivery um, and, and therefore there are inherent uncertainties um, around budgeting, but by working closely with colleagues on the program, uh, we can um, manage those in the, in the usual way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Michelle Ballantyne. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to pick up on sort of pulling together some of those threads actually around your CMS, because obviously that's the core component of, of, of the digital delivery. Um, and I understand that when the contract was let to IBM, the idea was that there would be a phased transfer of those skills and, and that underpinning knowledge so that you could run it within the programme. But at the time of the Audit Scotland report, that hadn't happened um, due to the resource shortages. Now, that's obviously going to impact going forward if that doesn't happen in terms of having... Because the CMS was pretty basic, wasn't it, when you started out, needs developing to, to deliver. So I just wondered where you are with that and what have you learned, you know, what, what lessons have been learned in the last year or so around that? I'll, I'll let Andy pick up on that point, but can I absolutely say the CMS system is, is not basic? It is absolutely fit for purpose. No, I for said it started out it's, as it's, a basic No, it system. has not started mm. out as basic. It started out as absolutely fit for purpose as required for Wave 1 benefits um, and is delivering well on that. It is the foundation to what we are delivering um, for, for Wave 2, but I don't want in any way for the committee to have the impression that this is not fit for purpose or doesn't do exactly what it needs to do for wave one. It does exactly what it does need to do for the benefits we are delivering at the moment. And it's one of the key areas that we will build on uh, for, for wave two. But I'll let Andy pick up on the detail point of that. OK, so on the, on the subject of resources, the, um, uh, the case management system is a, is a product which has been used elsewhere uh, in the UK and, and in Europe and around the world. Um, we have been recruiting skills in that space now for some 15, 16 months. Uh, we're making steady progress in that area. We still have a mixture of contractor and permanent civil servants in there, in that space. Um, but uh, we continue to grow our capability. We're still working alongside IBM and we're gradually taking the baton from them on, a, on an ongoing basis. We will continue to revisit our skills in light as, as we close out for wave one. And we're already modelling and increasing our capability as we look into wave two, because the product will be extended further for wave two. But at this stage, uh, as with all skill sets in the digital space, there is a challenge to recruit digital skills across the UK and across the globe. And this just happens to be one of the niche areas, um, but we're not reached a point where we can't find the skills. Um, and we are certainly doing an awful lot of work growing those skills internally in the civil service. Uh, we're doing some work with CoGlan, one of the Scottish government's and joint public sector initiatives to bring some skills into the into the programme and into my division in the coming months. Do you anticipate 
that we will be able to take full control of the CMS in terms of its management and development going forward? I, I do, yes. I mean, my, my aim is, is that we have, uh, my division will ultimately move into the agency at some point in the future and, and that, that whole digital command will underpin agency operations and mm. my view is that we will own uh, the running of that CMS for the, for the lifetime of the product. Uh, the software that underpins it is, is on a maintenance program anyway, but in terms of the technical skills that we need to run it, our aim is that we will ultimately own the entire control of that, of that solution. Right. Do you have any timetable for that? I mean, can you well, until, until we close out wave two and we've reached the end of the program and we know exactly on all the benefits are delivered and we actually know exactly what we need to actually t to take it into a steady state, um, our numbers are still quite fluid. But at the moment, we are keeping up with demand from the program in terms of what the program and suppliers need on the ground, and that current supplier is IBM for wave one. Okay, thank you. Okay, brief supplementary from Keith Brown. My apologies to Jeremy Balfour. We need to move through the various themes we're going to be asking questions on this morning, or we will run out of time. Uh, Keith Brown. I suppose it kind of covers a number of areas, and it's about really context. We've had the uh, quite entertaining um, view of people that never wanted this parliament to have these powers complaining they're not being used quickly enough, fairly regularly, which is is interesting. But I just wonder, in the context of, say, universal credit, I know it's a different scale. I mean, I, I think I first heard mention of it about 2011-12, and yet it was only rolled out. Uh, in fact, it's, it's still having major changes. But last year, compared to some of the benefits that you're now delivering, Best Start was mentioned earlier on. Can you just give us a bit of context on you know, timing? It seems to me it's been done pretty quickly, although smaller benefits, compared to some horrendous mistakes that we made elsewhere. It's just been interesting to know the context. Well, what is very uh, important that we do have context to, to hear, to see what has been delivered within um, the period of time since the Act was, was um, passed by the Parliament only uh, a year ago and since the agency opened its doors on the, the beginning of se September. Um, it is also very important to recognise within that context, um, and we have alluded to it at different points, uh, uh, particularly from a question um, answered by David Wallace. We didn't just start an agency and uh, deliver payments. What we did was establish the foundations for the delivery of the rest of the social security programme. So it's, it's um, simply not just that we have delivered Best Start grant uh, within a very short period of time. Uh, we're already seeing that being exceptionally successful. Uh, we're moving forward with uh, benefits this year that will ensure that by the end of 2019, we will be delivering um, seven benefits. That's, so that's by the end of 2019, it's about 18 months after a bill was, was passed by, by this parliament. Um, and we're doing so at a pace which is challenging. Uh, which is fast-paced and which Audit Scotland says is as fast as you can go if you um, want to hold very dearly to safe and secure, which, of course, um, we do. I take very seriously the, the lessons that we've got to learn from where projects have, have not gone well um, down south or, or elsewhere when unrealistic timeframes are, are set and um, the people who suffer from that aren't the politicians, they're the people who rely on those payments to come forward. Um, and that is why Safe and Secure is absolutely integral to everything that, that we do, because I will not risk the payments for some of our most vulnerable in society um, simply to push this programme faster um, than it, it can go. So the context is very important, and as is the point of the fact that we have an agency that is up and running. We have the systems that are in place that are the foundation for what we will go on before. So we haven't just delivered, impressive, although I think it is, what we have delivered within that year, but we've also set very strong foundations in place in terms of IT, um, in terms of um, fraud, in terms of the case management system. Um, all of that um, have now been tested and are working successfully and stand us in good stead as we build on them for Wave 2. Alistair Allen. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned some of the ways already that you've been cooperating with uh, the UK government of the DWP. Um, keen to know um, how that works in more detail. Obviously, Audit Scotland has been alluded to, and Audit Scotland say that you've done well to implement what you have implemented in time available, but they also say that the programme and the agency will be reliant on the DWP for a number of years. 
So I wonder if you could say a bit more about how that relationship works and what the challenges are. Well, the DWP and the agency it will be reliant on each other ongoing because we share clients now. So the simple fact of the matter is this joint programme, once the programme is complete, eh, we will rely on the DWP, they will rely on us um, to be able to provide um, information and um, assistance to people within our own areas, but to ensure that where we share clients that we do that um, um, effectively. I, I perhaps bring Lisa in to talk about some of the, the work um, on an ongoing basis with DWP. You know, I will have, as the committee knows, um, my fallouts with the DWP in a number of, of policy areas. Uh, but on the programme and our work around the devolution of benefits, I think we have a very good working relationship with the DWP, um, particularly um, their devolved benefits team. The challenges sometimes come when we're dealing with the rest of the DWP because it is such a, a just a massive organisation that clearly not everybody's first priority in the DWP is the devolution of benefits. So sometimes we rely on the wider DWP and that may be where some of the challenges come. However, I go back to the point that um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, that work is, is going on um, exceptionally well and there are very, very good relationships um, with the, the programme um, and um, now agency, now that it's gone live um, as, as well. And I go back to that example, which I gave earlier on, when we did um, a joint lessons learned over best start grant, you know, there was not two camps that sat there and kind of tried to lay the blame for, for anything. There was an absolutely joint commitment to how, how do we learn from this to going forward to which everyone recognises are the more complex benefits. So I hope that gives the committee some flavour of how there is genuinely good working going on um, on a day-to-day -day, um, and indeed hour by hour basis most times uh, to ensure that's going on. But I don't know if Lisa wants to talk on some of the teams that are set up and how that actually works in practice to again just give that little bit of reassurance um, about how, as I say, we will have our disagreements at a political level, but at a development level for the programme, I think it's going well. Yep. I would reiterate what the Cabinet Secretary is saying. We have joint pro project teams with DWP. We have joint plans. We have joint risks uh, in terms of lessons learned, some of the things that we've been doing. Um, and I hate the word, but it's called pre-mortem. So before we have a go live, we work closely with DWP of you know, what might happen, what could go wrong, how are we going to fix that if something goes wrong, what's that joint working look like? So the relationships at official level and running themes throughout the teams are really, really strong. We have similar relationships in the IT uh, space. Um, this isn't us in Scotland taking these benefits and then not having a relationship with DWP. We have to have an ongoing relationship. Our systems will continually need to talk to each other in the future. So it's absolutely essential that you know uh, we maintain those relationships and, and, and keep working together well. If you hate the word pre-mortem, I believe Taggart calls it anti-mortem. Um, can I ask on on that on not on that, but can I ask um, around the the r relationships that you've described there? Uh, uh, obviously, you have a a, a carers allowance uh, agency agreement. What what coming out of that will inform future agency agreements around other things? Are there things that you've learned from that that process that you would that you would want to inform future agency agreements? Well, the agency agreement was, of course, put in place um, over the carer's allowance to ensure that we got money into people's pockets as quickly as possible. So if we had not done an agency agreement with the DWP, we would have had to wait to increase carer's uh, allowance until we had designed, built and went live on a system. So the agency agreement was critical to ensuring that we could move uh, very quickly. And indeed, it was the first thing that the agency did was to pay out towards uh, carers, uh, which was an important priority for the government. Uh, when we're looking at agency agreements in particular, we will uh, look to, to use them um, going forwards. And I suppose that one of the the underlying core principles of uh, the agency agreements, which it's important to remember, is it's about that the delivery costs are met. So the costs of um, under an agency agreement will reflect the DWP's actual delivery costs. So if, if we didn't have an agency agreement with the DWP to pay carers allowance, the agency would have to have that um, actual delivery cost instead. And it is particularly 
um, it's actually prohibited uh, that from the DWP actually making a profit um, on agency agreements to ensure um, that we're getting um, fairness um, and, and value for money. So the agency agreements um, will be um, a, a part of the way that we will deliver. It ensures that we have an incremental um, build-up to delivery. Again, that's something which is important to ensure um, um, safe and secure transition. Um, and these are agency agreements which have been used uh, not just by this administration, but by previous administrations when the cases have um, 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 arisen that they have been required, and indeed by other uh, devolved governments elsewhere in the UK. So these are um, a, a normal part of, of government. We will use them only when required um, and when it ensures that we will deliver on a, a wider commitment to a safe and secure transition on an incremental basis. Finally, uh Perhaps something more specific. That, that's about um, universal credit and pro progress and discussions that you're having around uh, some of the areas uh, around uh, the implementation of split payments and so on as well. Just wondered if you had any comments around that. So we are absolutely determined to, to deliver on split payments, um, but we are absolutely dependent on the DWP changing their IT systems um, to, to be able to do that. So it's not something which I can just ask the agency to do, get the programme to just fix um, for me. This is something which must be delivered by DWP because universal credit remains a reserve benefit. So it, it has to be done in that way. So where we've got to at this point is that we have um, worked through our policy proposals and are now working with the DWP to see what that will look like in reality to, to determine what changes they would require to make to their IT systems um, and what that will look like uh, from from then. Uh, I think we um, furnished the committee with the two policy proposals that we went to DWP with that we asked them to do an option appraisal on um, and, and to test out. And we're working with the DWP to, to um, hopefully come to an, an, an agreement on where we feel that we are still absolutely achieving our policy requirement of split payments um, and that the DWP believe is um, is implementable through through their systems. So once we have reached that stage with the DWP, we will, of course, report back to the committee and to Parliament on, on how that's going. I can't put a, a time frame on, on that at the moment because, again, it is a, a joint project, uh, but officials are, are meeting regularly to, to work through that at this point. Thank you. OK, now, it's good to hear that there's a good working relationship with officials at a DWP level and a distinguish between policy decisions that are made by either government or decisions that are made at the most senior echelons of, of DWP from time to time, but actually the, those at the coalface doing the heavy lifting. Indeed, myself, I think Jeremy Balfour, when they went to Victoria Key, were told by some of your officials, Cabinet Secretary, that some of the, the DWP systems are, are quite antiquated and it's not, it's not a case of a skill shortage, it's a case of the folk who developed those systems at that time are no longer around, so you have to actually teach a new generation of skilled individuals how those skills were in the late 70s and early 80s. It's that kind of, 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 of context that, that, that you're working in. So the reason I mention that is because uh, on Wave 2 benefits, there has been a really close working relationship, particularly in relation to commitments in terms of disability assistance. Um, now, I've had reassurances in writing previously, Cabinet Secretary, from yourself in relation to disability assistance. I asked for them again from the First Minister yesterday at the Conveners Group meeting, and I know it seems like duplication, but I think it's important, given how carefully those on disability benefits are following progress at a Scottish level, that you put some of these aspects on the record again this morning. So, the, the position of the Scottish Government is that by spring 2021, the final disability assistance benefit for those of working age adults, that new claims will go through a Scottish social security system and assessment process. I'm assuming, I'm hoping you confirm again today, that is on track. But just as importantly, though, is that, and back to those DWP systems and talking to Social Security Scotland, that as we hit spring 2021, anyone in DLA or PIP currently 
who looks as if they're going to be invited to a reassessment process under DLA or PIP. That will trigger something between DWP systems and Social Security Scotland systems to say, no, that reassessment will not take place. Uh, those individuals will migrate over to the new Scottish Social Security system and whether or not there needs to be an assessment We'll put that to one side for a second. The important thing is that those individuals, our constituents who are looking at these developments, will be dealt with under a Scottish social security system from spring 2021 and not under a UK DWP system. I think that's the, the assurances that, that, that we're looking for. And I ask them again for a third time because people keep asking me and it's important to get that information out there, Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I can confirm, unsurprisingly, that what the First Minister said at the Conveners Group was absolutely correct. We are on track uh, with our delivery for new claims, but also taking very, very seriously our requirements around case transfer. And we're looking within case transfer about um, to, to ensure, I suppose, that we have some kind of key principles that underpins <laughs> that case transfer process. Uh, and one of the, the most um, obvious ones, say, certainly to, to the government, but we're open to um, if there are other requirements as, as well, is anyone that's about to come up for a, a review or, or a reassessment that people will move over to the social security system up here in Scotland. Now, that does, of course, as you quite rightly point out, convener, require joint working with the DWP to ensure that there's a trigger of rather than someone going for a review or an assessment, that that, that trigger is, well, actually, your case is going to be transferred up. The other aspect around the transfer, which is, I think is very, very important, is we will keep the individual um, closely involved and informed in what is happening to their case uh, so that they will be told when their case will be transferred. That will be explained to them that that does not involve a reapplication uh, to a new benefit, as will be required for people moving on to universal credit, uh, that we will transfer um, that their, their case over and that they will then be told when that case transfer is complete. So it's very, very important to realise that as we talk about large numbers and how do we do this on a technical aspect, that we are talking about people who uh, have had very bad experiences of the benefit system in the past, and this may be a, a, a time that will cause them concern. It's our responsibility to take that concern away and any anxiety away and reassure them uh, that they will be transferred and indeed particularly to ensure that there's no reassessment from the DWP. But I think you are quite right, convener, um, and, and I would just um, highlight the, the point that, that dealing with the DWP system um, is, is, is challenging because there isn't actually one DWP system. There are many DWP systems uh, that some talk to each other better than others. Some have been around for longer than others. And that makes it exceptionally challenging because we are not trying to get the agency to link into one DWP system, but we are, for some of the benefits in particular, getting the agency to link into various DWP systems, some of which don't talk that well to each other, never mind a brand new agency that we are establishing. So that is a particular challenge. It's one, of course, that the DWP are, are very uh, aware of as, as they go through, but makes the process of this unpicking a little bit of the benefit system and putting it up in Scotland exceptionally more complicated than if you were to um, um, have a, a wholesale change in a benefit system. That, that, that's helpful, and I, I, I think it's important that the Scottish Government keep strong communication in relation to um, the progress and timetable for disability assistance, because there's high expectations out there um, right, right across Scotland. Now, um, maybe we could get so, a bit of detail in relation to some of the progress that has been made. Um, so what is the progress uh, with uh, the detailed design, development and testing for disability assistance for children and young people, and we'd pick that one because that's actually going to be launched in just over a year's time. So, if you like, that's the the, the first target there the Scottish government's got. So, where is progress in relation to that? It, so, there's a great deal of progress. It's already um, well underway, as I've uh, said to the committee. Two out of the three major um, major contracts for uh, Wave Two have already been let, and I guess as I've referred to, we've already got in sight those who will be working on the um, on the digital portal 
uh, that's an important aspect of it, for example, because um, it's the first time that you'll be able to apply for disability assistance online. Um, and that will go through exceptionally rigorous testing, as all our application forms and online applications do to ensure that we're getting that right for the individual. So the digital portal um, work is, is already well underway. And when I met the team um, last week, we went through some of the information to ensure that um, we are picking up the right information in the right way, building on the lessons learned uh, that we already have for wave one. It's also important to stress, as I think I have already, that we've already done the discovery phases for all three benefits uh, for disability assistance. Um, that is absolutely integral because learning the lessons from um, the way that uh, other benefits have been brought in um, at a UK level, it's important that you find out what the system needs to do and what the people require of it before you begin building it. Now, that doesn't mean it's all set in stone, but it certainly gives you a far better starting point um, than, um, than, than not doing that. So those discovery phases um, are already complete for that, and that has given us a very good uh, sound basis um, for, for moving on uh, to, to the next phase of delivery. Obviously, the, the first one of those will be child daily. Um, we would point out also from um, an agency perspective uh, that we've already um, looking and started uh, recruitment for the decision makers for the, the initial um, disability assistance, which, as you point out, will be the, the, child, the children and young people. Okay, now... No. Now, this, this gets, I suppose, to the beef of, of the line of questioning, because we want to make sure the systems are OK, we want to make sure there's migration of information, we want to make sure the clever bits behind the scenes uh, do what they have to do. But it's about the policy intent of the Scottish Government and the Scottish Social Security Service and the difference that's supposed to make. Um, now, I'm aware you've sent a series of position papers to, to, to this committee when you outlined the timetable for delivery of benefits, and one of those was in relation to terminal illness and the changes in relation to that. What progress are we making in relation to developing clinical guidance for a session whether a terminal illness rules ought to apply? In other words, for that immediate and lifetime and long-term awards, other than under the current UK system where there's a lot of deep dissatisfaction? So there has been um, extensive consultation um, that has been ongoing, and I know it's an area where the committee showed um, a, a great deal of, of understandable interest as, as the, the, the bills went through. So the, the aspect that we've got to at the moment is taking that overall consultation and, and uh, discussion around the, 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 the Act um, and then moving on to how we develop that in practice. So the Chief Medical um, Officer established two groups to support this work. The Short Life Working Group on Terminal Illness for Disability Assistance um, is responsible, therefore, for developing the, the guidance for registered medical professionals to be able to make those clinical judgments about terminal illness. And a reference group was established um, as well, compromising um, wider stakeholders. Uh, so that work then led to uh, draft guidance, uh, which went out to managed consultation <coughs> Um, and that consultation closed on the 19th of April. Uh, so uh, we will now move to a point where the responses to that will again will be looked at by uh, the, the CMO, the Short Life Working Group, the Reference Group, and so on, before we move to publishing the complete guidance. And that will, of course, um, be well in train by the time where we have to deliver the first disability assistance packages for children and young people. Do you anticipate um, a role for, for this committee in relation just to being aware? Because obviously we want to make sure that clinicians are confident in how to apply that guidance. and want to make sure that the um, wider society out there who were, were really pretty clear that things had to change and how decisions around benefits and terminal illnesses were made had to happen. And that's something this committee would obviously want to assure ourselves that, 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 that that's going well. So when would this committee get a flavour of how that... I mean, I, I welcome the information that you've laid out and how that process is, is happening. But when would this committee get to see a lot more detail in relation to that? 
Uh, well, certainly when we get to the point of publishing the, the guidance that will be made available to, to the committee, and I'm, I'm sure the committee will take great interest um, in, in that. Um, and I, would, of course, and others would, of course, be happy to, to answer detailed questions at, at that point on that guidance in particular. Mm. And apologies, I know mean, other, other members want to come in. I think I've got Keith Brown next, but there's some technical questions that we just have to ask around a couple of things as well in relation to this. Uh, is there any further detail available for the policy to make an additional payment to carers of more than one disabled child from spring 2021, such as, for instance, the amount of payment and eligibility? So we're just trying to get that, that, that greater detail in relation to these wave two uh, entitlements. Certainly. Um, I, I can't give detail uh, at the moment on that because we are working through that um, internally. It's one of the, the areas, of course, that we'll have to um, work on uh, very quickly, but it is a it is a programme that, that works at pace and therefore we're still working through the detail of that policy at the moment. But it is absolutely our plan to deliver the additional payments to people who care for more than one disabled child um, for that to be on track for delivery in, in early 2021. And we'll, of course, provide uh, the committee um, stakeholders with a, a wider interest on uh, the detail of our thoughts on that in due course once, once that's a, a, a point to be able to take that out to wider consultation. Well, folks, this committee, of course, will want to look at the details of that uh, and, and amend our work programme accordingly to make sure we can do uh, due diligence and scrutiny around, around that. Um, and finally, if some people of pension age are to receive DLA under the administration of the Social Security Scotland, uh, what appeal rights, we've looked at appeals processes before in this committee, what appeal rights uh, provision for change of circumstances, term illness rules will apply? So, I mean, we know that, uh, sorry, we don't know. The hope from this committee is that the new system in Scotland will be more robust, more fair, more humane, more responsive, all of those things. That doesn't mean everyone is always going to get a positive outcome uh, when they go through assessment processes. So the appeals process has to be very robust, open, transparent <coughs> and supportive of, of those making appeals. So what kind of update can you give us around that? Uh, well, we're absolutely to, committed to ensuring that those cases are, are transferred over um, smoothly for, for the clients um, involved. We're committed to honouring the current awards at the point of transfer. Um, and that no one in receipt of DLA over age 65 will be worse off as a result of their case being transferred uh, to Scotland. We'll, of course, need to make provisions, for example, for uh, changes of circumstances um, and appeal rights and ensure that they are applied consistently with other forms of disability um, assistance. Uh, we're also keen to ensure that people who are in receipt of um, DLA for the over 65s and regarded as terminally ill who are not in receipt of the highest rates will receive higher rewards from the point they transfer to the Scottish Government. Okay, so, so some inbuilt protections there. It's quite helpful to put that on the record. Jeremy Balfour. Yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Can I just come back to the terminal illness? I, I mean, I understand from constituents, we've, a couple of constituents have been in touch with me, is that there is a draft guidelines are out for consultation at the moment, particularly amongst uh, the medical profession. Um, can I just seek clarification? Will this committee be able to take evidence from you and your officials on the draft guidelines, or will it only be on the guidelines once they are about to be implemented? I think there may well be input that this committee would want to give around the draft guidelines. I'm just wondering when do you, I think the consultation comes to the end, May time, so would it be when would it be appropriate for this committee to be able to have you back to ask you on those things? Well, I'll, I'll certainly take that back and, and look at when that, that can be most usefully done. What, what perhaps might be useful is if we go past the point of the closure of the consultation and ensure that the Short Life Working Group and the Reference Group have also had an opportunity to feed back on their thoughts. Uh, so we're further down the line on, on, on those aspects. Uh, but I'll be happy to get back to, to the, the committee on the kind of finer details of, of the, you know, if we have a time frame for when that would be, to be able to see wh where that would fit to, to allow the committee to do its work for planning um, better. So if that's agreeable to Jeremy Bath, I'll get back on the specifics on that point. Thank you. It's a really important question, Jeremy Balfour. I th essentially, uh, I think what you're saying is, how can this committee... Well, we want to anticipate things go very well, but how can this committee have a weather check on that before everything is signed, sealed and delivered so we can still have a point of influence? So I think that's the underlying 
a point being made, which would be very helpful, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, Board Convener. Okay, thank you. Uh, Keith Brown. Thanks, Convener. Uh, just very briefly, you mentioned before, Cabinet Secretary, about how the word safe and secure, the principles of being safe and secure underpin your approach. And also, I think in your statement that you made recently to the Chamber, you talked about being pragmatic about these things. And I just wondered if that is the kind of underlying philosophy around the approach you're taking to um, severe disablement allowance being a closed benefit and instead of assuming a power or um, exercising a power directly um, just for the sake of it, that's what underlies the approach of entering into an agency agreement to deliver this given it's a closed benefit. Is, is that what the thinking is here? I mean, certainly this, this is a, a, a busy programme and, and therefore it's important that we, I think, prioritise the areas where those with lived experience of the system feel are their areas of greatest concern. And the most obvious one for that would be around um, the application and assessment, reassessment process within disability assistance. It's not the only one, but it's certainly um, one of, of the major aspects around that. When we look at severe disablement um, allowance, um, there have been no calls for the government to make changes to, to this. Um, um, it is something which is um, a closed benefit. It has been closed for a considerable amount of time, I think from, from memory, um, 18 years. Um, and it is a very, very small and declining number of people. We're talking about a, a small a couple of thousand people on it. Now, if those people thought there was a requirement, a change, then of course we would take that on. It's not that it's a small number <coughs> that is preventing us from doing it. It's more that there is no call um, for um, this government to make any changes to it. So we have a benefit that has been closed uh, for some time. Indeed, um, I say it's been closed from new applicants since um, <coughs> 2001. Uh, we have a benefit that um, no one is asking to make any changes to, and we have another we have another wave of benefits that people are asking us to make a great deal of of changes to. So the priority for me is is that aspect. And uh, yes, I think it is pragmatic to to see and to be sensible about um, that <coughs> fact that my priority is around where people want to see change. Um, now, we're, I'm not closed to, to, to looking at this. If um, material comes back from the disability assistance that, that does flush out, but it hasn't done in the past, but if it does flush out, people are looking for changes, then of course we'll look at that. Because the reason that we're doing the, 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 the longer term um, agency agreement for severe disabled allowance is because people are not asking for change. So I will focus on the areas where people are looking for that change. OK, Polly McNeill. Thank you very much. Um, it's a question again on wave two benefits. Um, so, um, Cabinet Secretary will be aware that um, the industrial injuries disablement benefits are to be replaced with employment injury assistance uh, starting autumn 22. It's one of the benefits that the committee were made aware of at the very beginning that a lot of the information is helped by paper, <laughs> in paper, which we were surprised about. Um, so, uh, so it's not available electronically. So that's going to be a bit tricky. But more concerning is, so the UK government receives special advice and they have a panel and they're saying that that panel is only going to be open to UK ministers. So my questions are around, well, what's your thinking about um, the timescale for more detailed policy development? Um, would you try and do that in Scotland? Would you go back to UK ministers and say, well, look, would be much better given a specialist advice if we could tap into what you're receiving. Uh, well, this is the, the benefit that um, sits in clerical storage um, and therefore that does present particular challenges because we really are starting from scratch about the, a, a package to be able to, to deliver this. Um, the other challenge um, with, with this benefit in particular is that there is a, a great deal that impacts on the benefit that stays um, reserved. So uh, issues around, for example, employment, um, insurance, occupational health and um, safety that um, clearly presents um, um, uh, prevents the Scottish Government from introducing any statutory changes in, in those um, areas. 
So that's the context of, of what we're looking at. This is not a closed benefit, however, like uh, the mm -hmm. um, SDA. So we are looking to develop our own system up here in Scotland because it's a live benefit. But it will require um, it will require the government to deal with those complexities. And um, uh, uh, Deputy Convener, you quite rightly pointed out to, to one of those being the fact that based on the Scotland Act, we cannot refer uh, to, to the current expert uh, committees on that. It is going to therefore take us a longer delivery time because we're going to have to tease out the complexities of, of that system. And I suppose once we get that um, process done, we can then look at whether we need to have a similar structure up here in Scotland or, or what's the best way of doing it. So we need to get the policy right and to look at the changes that people are requiring um, and asking us to, to be made on this because, again, I go back to the fact that this is very different because um, it is an area where people are looking for change, um, but there's not one voice that's looking for one particular area as we have different um, stakeholders asking for, for different changes. So on, on that basis, um, it, it will be something which uh, we will look to do up here in Scotland, but it will require us to work through those complexities and challenges uh, before we make any changes to the system and before it's delivered by Social Security Scotland. So, so would that mean that expanding the scheme to include self-employed people would uh, not be possible then? I think there are just absolute limitations because of the, the restrictions, because of the, the reserved nature right. of it. So we're, we're going to come up, particularly on this benefit, there are other challenges on, in other benefits because they passport to reserved benefits. But for this one in particular, uh, the aspects on, on this do really um, um, come up against reserved areas very, very quickly self-employment being an example of where we, we you know we've been asked to look for change but under the current settlement uh, difficult to see how that that would be possible but I'm very keen that we do the proper policy analysis mm -hmm. to see where people's priorities are on this to see what can be done and to kind of test that to the limit of what's possible under the current settlement um, and I'm very keen to do that as I say that will take more time therefore just because of those complexities. So essentially, you've got three years then um, to make a determination on that. And if if the UK uh, government will not open up their specialist advice panel to, to the Scottish government, then you would have to almost replicate what they have. Would that, is that fair to say? If, yeah. if we're looking to run the, the benefit in the, in the same type of way that would require that, then yes, we would, we would have to look at a, a, a duplicate. So uh, the, the challenges don't go away. Uh, in a couple of years' time, but it does give us the ability to work through those challenges uh, very closely, again, with, with colleagues down at Westminster, not just within the DWP, but in wider areas, about how that could be done. But essentially, you need a solution in advance of 2022 so that you've got a specialist panel, or specialist information because of the complexity of the benefit. We, we, we do need a solution, yeah. yes, and as, as quickly as possible for that, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, now, I don't see any other bids for for questions at the moment. Jeremy Balfour. Um, thank you. I, I wonder if I could just go back to the financial stuff for one moment and just to get some understanding. Um, obviously, as you said, you, we were delivering all 11 benefits as of next year. Um, if there was to be a change within the criteria for a benefit, particularly maybe around the new PIP or whatever name it's going to be called, and that criteria meant more people were to get a benefit that have it at the moment. Is that covered under the, the agreement that is set up on the budget for 2020? Or would that be extra money that the Scottish Government would have to find? So if we're looking to make changes to uh, the criteria around eligibility, for example, they would need to be found uh, through the Scottish Block Grant that, that doesn't come from um, the transfer from Westminster because those are changes that the Scottish Government has made. Um, we will have to look at those changes again on a case-by-case -case basis uh, to test out how much they will cost um, and to fit that within our, 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 our budgets for the forthcoming years. And it's an important aspect that we do look at around this because what may seem small changes to eligibility uh, can uh, uh, add up to quite 
a substantial amount of money be just because of the, the, the sheer number um, of claimants that, that we will be taking forward for that. Uh, so we will, again, it goes back to, to, to the point we were making earlier about continuously refining the budgets, uh, not just on programme or on agency, but also obviously on how much the benefits will cost to deliver. And as we make those policy decisions, we will be upfront about the changes that that will require. And if they the, um, infer any increased budgetary pressure, then we'll, of course, be transparent about that to Parliament and, and how we will deliver that. OK. And that's all. And just um, a very funny question. If the intake, if, if the criteria stayed the same, but the, there was a greater in, uh, uptake, maybe because it was better publicised or whatever, would that be covered? Or is that game? Would that still have to be found out of uh, uh, the, the, the block grant? Um, if, if I could, if I could answer that um, under under the, the block grant adjustments, um, Scottish policy changes would would have to be found from the Scottish budget. We 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 would get a population share of any increases at UK level. So, for example, when we're looking at the benefit take up strategy, um, we need to very, very closely take into account if we are encouraging take-up of benefits, that is the responsibility of the Scottish Government to, okay. to, to deliver. OK, thank you. That's help. OK, I think we're all, almost here, Cabinet Secretary. I'm just conscious of maybe one, one final question, and then I think, as the Deputy Convener said, there may have been aspects of, 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 the, of your remit that you wanted to put in the record at an open statement at the start, so we'll give you that opportunity at the end. Um, but just in terms of the, the workforce, uh, the people who would deliver this system on the ground, we first visited uh, David Wallace in the, uh, Social Security Scotland and Dundee. Seems like quite some time time ago now. Um, we were quite encouraged by um, the inclusive nature of seeking uh, applicants to, to apply, not just to claim benefits, but also to apply for positions within Social Security Scotland. So anyone that had went online, started to do an online application for a job, but didn't follow it through, if there was contact details there, Social Security Scotland would give them a call and say, look, you were thinking about applying for a job. Is there a reason why you didn't do that? So that, that was pretty good. Um, but the question I would ask now is, as that headcount increases, have you done an audit of how diverse that workforce is? Uh, in terms of whether it's protected characteristics or, or just whatever, how, how diverse is that workforce is and how are you trying to encourage underrepresented groups to be part of, of that team? Well, it is a point. I'll let David pick up on some of the um, particular highlights from uh, the recent insights that, are, that have been published, I think, just this week on, on the diversity of, of the workforce. Um, and I think it is a very important point because we were determined to ensure that the workforce of the agency represented the wider public and indeed the people who would be using the service. I'm very pleased to see that um, what we have been putting in place to encourage wider recruitment is paying dividends. Uh, there are still areas where we of course want to see further improvement, but the one that particularly struck me when we were discussing um, the statistics was around the, the number of people who are self-declaring as, as having um, as being disabled or with a long-term condition. And that's particularly important, I think, given our uh, desire to have, as I say, an, an agency that reflects the people of Scotland and the people that, that they will be serving. Uh, yeah, pick up some of the details, David. Yeah, I, I'm just echoing it. It does feel quite a long time ago we had that conversation. But, uh, yeah, I think just yesterday we published our first uh, sort of insights, both to our client group and also to... Uh, our, our workforce as well. So on all of those sort of protected characteristics, um, we've been able to demonstrate that we're slightly above the sort of Scottish uh, working age pop population, uh, whether it's for ethnicity, for disability or sexual orientation. So, so we're, we're pleased that we're, we're able to sort of be above that sort of baseline. We absolutely wouldn't take that as, as where we'd want to get to. We want to use this to continue to improve that, both in terms of our recruitment uh, selection and, and how we really start to, to kind of continue those inroads. So this is very much the, the first set of reports, and we're working really closely with our analysts to try and follow through uh, some of these. I think the point that you were making, follow through why people um, drop off and don't get through to, to work for the agency as much as those who do as well. I think that's important. But also, Mr. Wallace, please, that's wel welcome news. If that initial um, analysis is showing that a bit above where um, other public agencies are in relation to this kind of thing, then hopefully some you're doing something different 
within Social Security Scotland to make that happen, this must be an opportunity to share what you're doing different with so in Social Security Scotland with other Scottish governmental and partner agencies to have some of that um, greater diversity in the workforce as well. So will you be not... <laughs> slightly distracted there. Um, will you be sharing the approach that Social Security Scotland has carried out uh, with other Scottish government agencies and with other partners to make sure that the diversity elsewhere in the public sector can be improved? Uh, absolutely, and we do that also through Scottish Government HR as well, so we work really closely with them and there's learning on, on both sides. Equally, we, we absolutely wouldn't claim that in some way we have a, a way of doing this that trumps everything else. So it is about learning from others. And, and I, again, I think the point that people have seen when they've been in Dundee in particular, drawing on the sort of the goodwill and expertise that exists within the stakeholder community, within the third sector, to, to kind of really try and reach out to, to people that we haven't been able to reach before. But, but absolutely, share the, the purpose for doing this is for our own improvement, uh, to, to try and continue that, that kind of journey, but also to share and learn from others as well. OK, thank you. Now, we're almost at the end of this evidence session. Uh, just before I move to the next agenda item, Cabinet Secretary, I don't know if there's any, anything you want to put on the record at this point. Uh, not to this point, apart from one thing, it would be remiss of me um, to, to not point out that the other um, figures within those insights pointed to a 98% and a 100% client satisfaction rate um, with the agency at this point. And I think that is a very uh, positive uh, note for me to end on. I, 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 I suspect you've been missing a trick. Cabinet Secretary didn't put that on the record be before the evidence session concluded uh, this morning. So can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and your team of officials for co-long supporting you in the evidence session uh, this morning. We look forward to working with you as the Wave 2 benefits uh, roll out. Uh, but that does uh, conclude Agenda Item 2, and we'll just suspend briefly at this stage. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back, and uh, we'll now we'll move back slightly. Uh, we, we need to take agenda item one, which we didn't take earlier, which is decision to take items in private. The committee has asked you to agree that item four, consideration of evidence heard earlier in the meeting, and that item five, consideration of a draft annual report, be taken in private. Is the committee agreed? Yes. Okay, that hope with that wholehearted approval there, uh, we shall uh, move on. So we now move to agenda item three, which is still in public session on subordinate legislation. Can I refer members to paper two? Note by the clerk. The committee is invited to consider the Council Tax Reduction Scotland Amendment number two, Regulations 2019, SSI 29 forward, 2019 forward slash 133, which is subject to the negative procedure. Is the committee content to note this instrument? Yes. Okay. Questions just to get it right in my head. So this is relating to the council tax benefit withdrawal that happened a number of years ago. Council tax uh, reduction regulations were brought in in order that, that benefit would continue be, to be paid. And I'm just trying to see if I've got this right in my head. And this is to try and make sure that because of the late, the later introduction um, of changes, that the discretionary housing payments are not treated as. So this is basically about protecting people's. Um, rights under that. Mm -hmm. it, it just be used, I mean, it, uh, I think just be sort of get a bit of background. Is any more background there? Because I'm, I'm new to the committee, it was all. Mm -hmm. There's a policy note, but I just. So, yeah, I. The way you've explained it, uh, Mr. Brown, would also be my understanding, having read the same policy note as yourself, and I looked round to, to our clerk, who, who would seem to think that, that that's the understanding also. Now, I mean, I can't really answer that question, I suppose, because, you know, uh, it's my job to scrutinise this as well rather than answer the questions on this. But I suppose if we want additional information in relation to this, we can we can uh, seek that from SPICE uh, um, okay. and let's just do that. But I'm assuming that doesn't uh, take away from merely noting the instrument at this stage and we can still get agreement on that. No, I, and I, you're right, I, mean, I, just, I can go and check myself at um, SPICE and so on. I just wasn't aware, having not been involved in committees in consideration of SSIs for a number of years, that it was as perfunctory, if you like, as that. I, I, I thought there'd be a discussion, but if people understand that and they've been involved in this previously. One last question, just if I could ask that. So this this would not apply um, elsewhere in the UK. This is simply in Scotland that this this benefit, if you like, is continued. I see, I see, I see nodding heads. It's slightly unfair on the clerks, given the fact they're not they're not here to give evidence, but to to to, to advise us. But but uh, uh, the, the the official report will show the, the nod the nod of a head. Elsewhere. Yeah, and there, there are there are other schemes elsewhere. Right. Uh, it's been drawn to my attention that we don't we won't actually have to ask Spice for additional information on this. There's a more detailed briefing available, so we can make sure okay. that gets sent round sent round the members. The important thing though is that that, that we just formally agreed to note this so we can move on at this point. Is that agreed? Okay. 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 Thank you very much. And we do now move to agenda item four, delivery of devolved benefits, which we've just previously agreed to take in private. We're now moving to private session.